<laughs> What's going on, guys? How's everybody doing? Good. How are you? Good, man. Good, man. I'm excited to have you guys here. It's actually crazy because we started the Chris GQ Perry TV in my room, and now we're taking it a little bit bigger. But um, time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, and I think it's important to get everybody's perspective, not just mine. So that's what the whole point of this event is to talk about the power of partnership, understanding healthy masculine and masculinity and femininity in relationships. Cause that's something I'm passionate about. And I would love to get your guys' perspective on that stuff as well. Well, absolutely. We can definitely do that. Um, I do have some experience. I've been married for over four years now. Well, before we, before we even get into that, yeah. let, let, let's, let me introduce, well, you guys can introduce yourselves. Just tell me a little bit about yourselves and what you guys do. My name is Ebony Hato. I'm a local entrepreneur. I help uh, black and minority owned businesses uh, get contracts with the state and federal government. Um, I also teach business classes and I'm a mom and I love to travel. <laughs> I'll pass it on. All right. Well, who doesn't like to travel, right? <laughs> I guess I should add I've been married for three years. Yeah. Remarried this my what second marriage. What are some cool places you've been to? Um, so I've been to Africa a lot recently, um, but I grew up in Europe, actually. So I, I've been to a, a lot of European countries that are like surrounding Germany. It's my kind of it's my thing to travel. Caribbean, all that. All that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Johannes Bailey. And speaking of the Caribbean, that's where I'm from. I was born in Guyana in South America. Grew up in St. Lucia, different islands. Um, and I'm the owner of Black Fur and Media. A co-owner, in fact, I have a business partner. His name is Dustin Tang Chung. Uh, we do a uh, video and audio media production company here in the Southern Tier and across New York State. Um, truth be told, I'm on my second marriage, so I know a little bit about relationships and marriage. I've had my own failures, my own successes, and I'm hoping that I have some knowledge that I can share with the audience that they can learn from and appreciate and maybe I'll learn a few things today too. You Amen. Know, the cup, the cup is always only half full. Sir, sure. my name is Amira Davis. I am the co-owner of D Five Consulting Group. Um, I've been married for almost thirty years. Um, from upstate New York, uh, own it with my husband. Um, we like to travel. Well, I like to travel. His idea of traveling is our backyard. That's what he tells me. He said, "Why would we want to go anywhere when we can travel in our backyard?" <laughs> So that's where we travel to, is from the backyard to the front yard. Listen, I've seen your around. backyard. There's, there's, there, I wouldn't leave that backyard. <laughs> a lot of either. acres back there. That's, that's, nice, that's a nice backyard. It's a nice backyard. You see it every day. He's like, why would you want to go anywhere else? That's where we can travel to. Right. So that's us. That's awesome. And I, I'm glad that I have you guys on the panel because we're getting different perspectives. Having somebody that was married so long, yeah. it's just, I've only been with my girl for five years and we've been through a lot. So 30 years is, is, is amazing. And I'm sure there's a lot of content and, and, and experiences you can share with us today, as well as Johans, as well as Ebony. So this is going to be exciting. We are going to touch on topics that are a little uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but I feel like that's important because a lot of people don't want to talk about these things. And in 2023, there's so much different perspectives and everybody just freedom of speech is a really free right so like some of these topics may get a little uncomfortable and i, I do want to touch on them though because it's something i'm passionate about so going into that let me just say this um what does healthy masculinity and femininity mean to you anybody can go, Man, I don't go first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i hit you with the, with the big question first <laughs> What, what, is it, what does that mean to you guys? I think it's subjective, right? It's, you know, being in touch with yourself, but, you know, what it, femininity to me might be different than what it might be to my daughter. So, right. you know, for me, it's, it's being vulnerable. It's being able to, um, vulnerability, I think, is a very big thing in femininity. I think it's, I also use it like when we're doing things outside, I'll say, well, I'm a woman, you should be doing this for me. And he's like, well, you want to be a woman when you're doing this, but when you're doing this, you don't want to be a woman. So I think it's, it's right. just subjective, but I think it's a lot of it for me is just being in touch with who you are and mm -hmm. being vulnerable. That's a big thing. Do you feel like, um, well, let me just ask you this first. What's your, what's your, 
what does masculinity mean to you? To me, masculinity means um, being supportive and being loyal and being someone who takes care of right. the way I see it. And so I see it as, as an old school, I think, being taken care of, but still being able to let me take care of myself, but knowing hmm. what I need and what I don't need or what I want and what I don't want. And that's hard to know what somebody, to read somebody else's mind. Yeah. You know, he's not the thought police. I wish he was sometimes, not all the time, but it's it's hard to know what somebody wants and what somebody doesn't want. So, you know, I think it's just being, in, for me, having someone that is supportive and that's, you know, masculine, change my tires if I need to, or change the oil, or if I say, you know, my tires are running low on the car, Sunday he'll go out and he'll go, you know, I, I did the oil in your car, or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you've been running on empty. So I took the car down and I filled up the gas tank for you. Things like that, that's what he does. And that's, that's what I appreciate about him. He takes care of the house. He takes care of, you know, the things that I take for granted are things that he does. And so, you know, we all show love in different ways too. So right. where I might say, I want flowers, I want whatever, the little things that he does that that I take for granted, when I realize, gosh, he did the, these things, that's another sign mm. of love, so. That's actually good that you mentioned that, is having that security if you need it, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that you could do it on your own, Yep. but having somebody to fall back on if you need that is, is an amazing thing. That's what masculinity is all about, is knowing that you can depend on somebody because we live in a generation, things have changed. When you say masculinity in the world today, people think, woman, do what I say, <laughs> whatever I want, you do it, and you just listen and shut up, right? Yeah. That's not what I mean when I say healthy masculinity. And I'm, I'm gonna allow you guys to speak after, but I just wanted to get this out because I feel like it's powerful. When I say masculinity, I say, a man that can protect, provide, and lead. But also, we have so many like women now that are just so smart and intelligent that, that, that are entrepreneurs, that are successful, that are go-getters. They don't want to sit at home, and that's okay. But having a man in your corner that you know if you need to vent or talk to, he's there, and he'll be able to talk to you. He'll be your support system. You can depend on him. Not a man in your corner that you feel shaky with or you can't really trust or, you don't, or, or he's more stressed than help having that peace that's a healthy masculine man so that a woman can have femininity without a man she can flourish in her femininity when a man is not around correct but and i want to ask you ladies this question how hard is it for you to feel strong and comfort comfortable in your femininity when you're doing it all by yourself when you don't have the help of somebody else and you're doing all the roles. And I, it's, it, I kind of want to ask Ebony this question because I feel like I've heard your story and you've told me a little bit about you and I think it's powerful. And I think that it can change a lot of people's lives just hearing your story and how you've come through and you've succumbed so much and you've, you're this businesswoman now and you're so successful, but it took you so long to get there and you've been through a lot to get there yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, I mean, there have been tons of nights where I cried myself to sleep, of course. Um, you know, for about 10 years, I was a single mom with four kids of all different ages. Like I have one who's an adult and lives on his own and I have one, you know, that's still in elementary school. So it's been a rough road. It's been up and down. Um, I didn't grow up with my biological father in the house. And so I know there's always like this stigma of like daddy issues and girls going through all these um what do we call them, like maladaptive behaviors or whatever. And I had my days with that. I definitely had my days with that. Um, and just trying to come out of it one day, I just decided to be a different person. You know, when I was in that, I was okay with the person I was. Um, and then one day I just decided, you know what, I need to step it up a notch and be a little bit better. Not that I'm better than anyone else, just challenging myself, right? Being my own competition. And that's really how um, I've been able to bring me and my kids out of poverty. Um, you know, I make well above the median salary here now. So, you know, it's a blessing, but it's also hard work. You know, you still have to um, grind and get up every day and show up when you don't want to be there, right? Um, there's a quote that's like, make your bed, right? If you can't make your bed, how are you going to finish the rest of the day? And so that's kind of something that I live by. Powerful. And I, I'm kind of digging in a little too early, but there's, 
the topics you guys are bringing up. I got other questions. I want to go back to the to the masculine and feminine question. Oh, we, about, we about to jump in. That's the whole conversation. We okay. about to get crazy. <laughs> but I do want to say this. And this is for you ladies. How hard is it? When you're doing everything on your own, and I can ask you this before you met your husband, and when you, when you well, you met him at such a young age, so it's hard. <laughs> He's laughing. But yeah. I'm just going to say this because I feel like this is a powerful question. When you're doing everything on your own as a woman, and you don't have help, and you're doing it all by yourself, and a man comes into your life, the role that he plays in your life determines how much that you give because it's such... Yes. An emotional state to be in as to give him your feminine side is like giving him a piece of you when you don't have pieces to give because you're trying to keep it together for yourself. 100%. For your family. Mm -hmm. How important is it for him to step into that masculine role as a man to take on the responsibility, not just the responsibility of you, but your kids and be in a solid relationship and healthy relationship with you? Yeah, so I've been in relationships with people who like wouldn't wash the dishes or sweep the floor because they thought that was women's work. <laughs> Weird stuff like that, right? And I stayed around. Why? Who knows? But right now, so the, the husband that I have right now, um, I don't know. I feel like in our relationship, mas masculinity and femininity is kind of like fluid, you know? If I'm sick, he does the laundry, you know? Right. Some days the laundry is his whether i'm sick or not you know what i mean so just a person who can come in and just you know get in where they fit in right and be that person so i always say a nice man found me and my children and he's ready to you know do right so um just and then sometimes there's days where i have to be more masculine right because bills got to be paid or an emergency happened or what have you right and i'm here by myself but I still have those moments where I'm like vulnerable, he's vulnerable, right? And I'll call him and be like, ugh, today was horrible and this blew up and that blew up, right? And things didn't go right. And he's he's the one that's more sensible then, right? And more calming and more subdued, if you will, right? Bringing me back down from crisis mode or whatever it might be. So to me, I think femininity and masculinity can be fluid, especially if you're in a relationship where two people actually wanna be there and wanna be involved with each other. Mm. That's my experience now anyway. <laughs> I, Amen to that. I, I agree. I think also, you know, I, I know we've been together since we were, I was 18 years old when we got together, but we grew up together. So being vulnerable for both of us, I think was difficult because even though we were together since we were 18, we were growing up. And so you think what an 18 year old's like, as opposed to a 25 year old, as opposed to a 35 year old, and then a 45 year old, we were vulnerable in different ways and so had to learn to trust each other in different ways so it didn't just happen when we were 18 years old we had a lot of life experiences that we had to go through and say hey are we going to stay together for this or are we not going to stay together and am i going to trust you and are you going to trust me because you know trust is it, it goes both ways and it's not just about there's different parts of relationships that are you know people always think you know infidelity you know finances whatever there's way more to it than that mm -hmm. and so you know it's it's being you know vulnerable in in those situations and i think that was what was big for us and so it still took us a long time to earn that because you're getting married you're having kids you're trying to start a, a family you're trying to go to college i mean we did we did everything backwards backwards but we stayed together so i think that's what made us more vulnerable with each other because we had to be you, you stuck through it. And we were talking about that yeah. earlier, how now with social media and everything, it's so there's so many fish in the sea, right? There's always somebody that's gonna be better looking. There's already somebody that's gonna be more successful or have more money. And it's so easy to find that person to think the grass is greener on the other side, but the grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it, right? right. We go through the honeymoon phase, which we talked about. But after that one, two years of the honeymoon phase, that's when real life sets in. And that's when, you start realizing somebody's flaws and you start to realize people aren't perfect and the struggles become more real. And it's very, you have to be willing to put the groundwork in because without groundwork, the relationship won't work. There's no perfect relationship. There's, you're not going to always love your partner. Yeah, I mean, I it becomes a choice after a while, um, essentially, you know, something that I've talked about, it becomes a choice. You know, you know, we, we can't, we can't separate emotion mm. from logic. Right. And, you know, Infatuation gets confused a lot of times with love, 
and love changes over time, but we also have to infuse logic into the equation, and that's where the choice comes in. You know, some people have made the choice to stay with the same person because they have kids together, and others might judge and say, well, that's not you taking care of you. Who's to say it's not? You know, maybe they need to make that decision to make sure that they raise happy, healthy young people. Maybe that's part of their purpose and their, their life mission is to raise young, well-adjusted people. And I think we, we've, seen, um, we've seen over time that having the dynamic of a masculine and feminine energy in the home mm. um, has most of the time proven to be very positive in families. So we talk about that role, we talk about sometimes it becomes a choice. Yeah, because you look at, I mean, you look at like my kids, our kids, like we laugh because we'll say like one of the kids has an issue. Who do they go to? They come to me. And then I'll say, well, did you talk to your father? No. Well, talk to your father. Well, I don't want to talk to him. But if they need something, they know that he's always there if they need something. Right. But they don't want to go to him because the feminine part of myself is what they want to go to when they need the the reassurance that everything is okay and the just, you know, this is what my day is like. But they know when push comes to shove, if they need something, more than likely it's it's the two of us together, but it's gonna come from him. So they're, they won't reach out to him most of the time, unless I make them, they'll make me do it. But you know, they know that if they need something, the masculine, he's there. Tell me why it's so hard to, to talk to daddy though. As, <laughs> why? As, a, as a father, like why can't we be approached? Let me, why, why, can't they, why can't the kids talk to us? Cause sometimes? you guys are intimidating to them. I think, I think I mean, even my, my, my 27 year old who is, He's a big guy. I mean, he's a he's a big masculine guy, and when he's around his father, he's like a little kid again. It's like he he's just you know whatever. And with me, it's funny because the older that get with me now, it's more like he's trying to take on a protector role with me. But with his dad, it's like no, they're like little kids again. All all three of them actually. And with me, it's completely different. So I don't I don't know. I'm with I'm like that with my dad though. Yeah. If I need something, I go to my mom. Yeah. If I if I have an issue, I call my mom. And then she'll tell my dad. And then he'll say, why didn't you tell me? And I'll say, because it was easier to talk to mom. But you said the key point there, like if they need dad, they can go to dad, right? They can. That's what matters. And, and then I know yeah. we were talking a little bit before and yeah. how um, dad shows them how to mow the lawn and change the oil, like yeah. manly things, right? Yeah. Manly quality, the qualities that men need to learn. And yeah. it's tough because I'm gonna allow Johans to speak on this in a second, because I know this is something you're very passionate about too is how important it is for young men to grow up with a male figure in their life to see that, to see how to be a man because there's so many men growing up with just their moms and then when they get into a relationship, they don't know how to take care of their woman. They just want their woman to take care of them the way their mom took care of them. Mm. Yeah. And I think that that's a very, that's an issue because then yeah. you notice so many and I'm not trying to downplay moms because single moms do all they can and they're great and they give all the keys. But it's hard because, you know, there's certain keys that men don't grow up with that they need to see. They need to see a man doing certain things. When I grew up with my dad, you know, I saw my dad. He taught me how to mow the lawn. He taught me how to work outside. He showed me how to play football. He, he taught me, showed me through what he did how to treat a woman. And that was very crucial for me because my mom could tell me till she's blue in the face, this is how you treat a woman. <laughs> I'll be like, okay, cool, but I don't see nobody treating you that way if she yeah. was the single mom. Yeah. And that, that's the hard truth. But to see a man do it and implement that into his life, it's like, okay, now this is how you treat a woman. So this is how I have to go into a relationship. And on the flip side, my girl, Brittany, grew up with a very strong father. So for her to grow up with a father figure that taught her what to expect from a man that's very powerful because now she knows if you don't treat me like my dad treat me, treated me, I'm not going to deal with you because I know what to expect and I know what expectations to hold myself to. It's very important. And even my sister, same thing. Like I know she's been through a lot, but she could always has my dad to fall back on. And I know that that's a huge security, having your dad, having your mom there, having that security blanket. It's just very important in, um, in relationships. You know, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, so absolutely. how do you feel like you play your role, <clears throat> Johans? Why do you feel like the masculine role is so important in the in the household? For myself, I, you know, I have over time developed a really good relationship with my uh, my father. Um, but I have examples in my in my life growing up of not so stel stellar. But I'm thankful that I had 
a relationship with him in speaking to a lot of what you're saying, where I would go to work with him. He was a, a guy who believed, and he, he's, still, he's still alive, so he is a guy who believes in vision. You know, he's a guy mm-hmm. that believes in, in kind of making you, your world the way you want it to, to, to be by first formulating a plan of execution. Um, and he would talk about, when I was a little kid, about what he was going to do. He was going to make it to America. Um, he was going to have that white picket fence. He was going to raise his kids in the suburbs, and they were all going to be educated. Well, mission accomplished. But I, I was with him when he was a young man. I was born when my dad was 25. So I kind of, in a sense, kind of seen him ev- evolve over time. And one of the things he was able to do is to work his butt off and, and complete whatever objective that he had in that way. So I would go out with him at three o'clock in the morning while he was working in Brooklyn, go to the car wash, wash cars for hours. Then his wife would bring him some lunch or something like that when she was in school. And then he would go to a moving company and work till like probably 12 o'clock that night, moving people and stuff around Brooklyn, Staten Island, everywhere. And I remember asking my father, I was like, dad, how do you, like, how are you doing this, man? Like, like how I'm sleeping in between the jobs. I'm like, I'm napping. I'm complaining because it's summer vacation and I'm with my dad instead of being right. at the park. He's like, I got to do this, son. I got bills to pay. I got to take care of you and your siblings and making sure that they're fed and everything like that. And I saw that and I was like, man, I can't do that. I, don't, I can't do that. And then one day it clicked for me. I was like, this is what you do. And you know, my wife is sitting here as well, um, talking to her. Her dad did a lot of the same stuff. And for and her, I, I could tell just seeing yeah. like her presence, like she, she demands a certain type of respect from a man. <laughs> she does. She does. Absolutely. And I love um, that. And, I, and she, she has a very powerful presence to her. Yeah. And you could just, you could tell she had a you know, positive male figure in her life. Well, yeah, but I'll be to summarize it. I mean, essentially, you know, having that male role model and figure in your life for both men and women is, is hugely important. I'm um, in the formative years and, and we look at that and we draw examples from that. Even if your dad isn't preaching or you're not talking to him, they're still watching. They're mm-hmm. watching everything you do. Right. And how powerful is that, right? Yeah. Because I say this, the man sets the tempo in the relationship and that's what I believe, period. Going into it, a woman's gonna react off of how you treat her in the beginning and what what you said. So if you're a provider, you a man lead is a provider and he protects and he leads. If you do those things, you open up the door for her to flourish in her femininity because she feels comfortable with you. And in return, when a man has that, he has a safe place now because he has a woman that he can come to a home to that brings him a, a home. He feels comfortable. He knows he could, he could trust her. He has a teammate, right? Yeah. Tell I know you and your husband been together 30 years. You guys have a have a business together now. And it, I I didn't I didn't really talk to him too much about it, but I'm sure like if I asked him, he'll tell me, yeah, I, I trust my wife. I put everything into her. And mm-hmm. I know that if I'm going through something, I can go and talk to her. And that's powerful. That's not just something that happens. That's yeah. not something that he just was able to do with you. That was built over time, right? And that, and, and that's something that's very powerful for men. And I want to say I'm not just for the women, I'm for the men. And I say that in the sense where when you treat your woman good and you lead correctly, now you as a man, you have a woman that you can confide in because the world is so hard on men. It's harsh on men. We're working all the time. We're grinding. We're trying to provide for our family. Where is our safe place? Because it's not the world. Because if we're not doing our part, what happens? We're attacked by the world. We're, we're beaten down. We're not good enough. Really? We're not providers. Who's the person that we can always come to and talk to and vent to or that we're supposed to be able to talk and vent to? And that's our woman. And how much are we pouring into our woman so that she creates that safe place for us? You think sometimes, though, we take I know I take it for granted because I look at him and I look at what his job is. and I look at how busy he is and and the responsibility that he has that he has and then the kids and then me and then the home. And I think sometimes it's easy for me to take it for granted, like why can't you pay attention to me? And then when I think about everything that he's going through while trying to still be the provider and trying to take care of everything, I think to myself, that's a lot, that's heavy for him. And so for him, the way, it's easy for him to just close off. And so in my, for us to communicate, sometimes we struggle there because I think, I'm like, I don't understand why you're being this way. And then I think about it, I was like, gosh, he's got a lot. Uh, he's got a lot on his mm. on his plate. And so there's times I need to give him grace and say, you know what, 
I, I get it. And so if me, the one who wants to communicate and he's the one who wants to close off, I just need to say, let him go. Right. Let him go, let him be, and let him have his time. Because again, being together for this long, we now realize the way we communicate is different and it's okay and we'll come together at some point. But where he wants to be the one that's so, you know, he's more closed off than I am. Right, right. And I was like, why don't you want to talk to me? And when we were younger, it would always be the, you know, chasing him down. Why don't you want to talk to me? Why? Well, why don't? And, right. and now it's like, you know what? You, you go do what you do and that's it. But that comes with time too, right? You know? Yeah, I think yeah. it comes with maturity too. Yeah. I know in my first marriage, I was like that too. Yeah. You know, first of all, you're scared to fail. Yeah. So then you're like overcompensating for that. Yeah. Then you want him to talk to you about everything. <laughs> but then as you get older, you realize like, um, he'll come and talk to me in his time, right? So yeah. you just kind of let it go. Yeah. And it'll be like, you know, within the next seven days, right? He'll come to you like, oh my God. Ah. Yeah. Mm. So it goes both ways, you know? It's great. I always say to Sam, I said, you know, his answer to everything, the first answer you ask him a question, it's always no. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, yes. always, it's, it's always no. But or we'll I, talk I, about it at home. Yep. And I know now I give him time and then it's probably always going to be yes. But it's just, you know, you want, nope. Don't want to do it. Yep. That's fine. But then you give him time and he thinks about it and he processes mm. it. And it's just, I think it's just his, his safety network. Right. He just needs to say, no, not doing it. Let's start a business. Nope. Well, that's a valid point because <laughs> communication, a lot of the issues that, a lot of things that come with questions, especially questions that are hard or when somebody's upset is anxiety, right? So yeah. it's easy for me to say no right now because I, even just asking me that question, I have a lot of built up anxiety. So yeah. give me some time to answer that. Yeah. And that brings me into this story that I, I love talking about because I read it in a book. And it's um, this woman was angry with her husband. She was doing laundry and it was a very small laundry room. And she was just like, man, I, this room is just so small. I hate it. Like, why is this laundry room so small? And the man was in the other room and they got into a huge argument. And it all started because, I mean, it was miscommunication in his mind. Her saying that laundry room was too small was saying that he can't afford a bigger laundry room for her and he's not financially where he needs to be. Yeah. So he reacted out of his anxiety of that. Mm -hmm. And all reality, she was just frustrated and women are just a little bit more emotional sometimes and they sometimes they just have to vent and let things out. So being able to, which takes a lot of practice, step back and analyze why you feel, the, the real reason you feel the way that you do before you answer or you communicate with your partner is so important because we just react and it's not, and it's, we only react because it's anxiety. I got a lot of anxiety. I don't know how to react. So I'm just going to try to defend myself instead of stepping back and trying to understand your partner. Like, okay, this is, I want to understand why you feel this way and I want to validate your feelings. And then after I validate your feelings, maybe we could communicate. And like you said, maybe it'll just take a little bit of time. It could take a little bit of time for me to process that yeah. till I get a little bit better yeah. at, at doing that. So that's, that's very powerful. Yeah. Thank you guys for sharing that. I'm, I'm a little extra with it. Like <laughs> I, I made Jay take a psychological test before I married her. No, you didn't. I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. Cause I wanted to know like how she processes. Wow. Cause I have a hard time with a silent, silent treatment. Silent treatment makes me feel like the relationship is over. Yeah, yes. and, that's um, fair. I don't like that. I like to, because I verbally process, right? Yeah. And she doesn't. She needs time to think. So I think communication, like what yeah. you guys said. Absolutely. Communication and check-ins. For those of you out there that like to uh, give your partner the silent treatment, that's okay. But at the same time, show them the respect of check-ins and say, hey, look, I need some space. And I'm going to get back to you in like a day or so. Or we, we can continue the conversation. Day or so comes by, you say, "Hey, look, I need a couple more days." Yeah, but just check in, and that's that's part of respect. So, um, yeah, just learning your partner. Um, for me, psychology is huge. Knowing who you're with, how they process, how they think, that's all part of the process. Amen. So, we got we jumped around a little bit, yeah. but I do want to ask each of you guys some questions, if that's cool. Yep. So. Um, We'll start with Amir. Okay. How has your personal growth as a woman evolved over the course of your long-term marriage? Mm -hmm. It's evolved for sure. I think when we first got together, I was just I was 17 years old, turned just turned 18 years old. So I was very naive about what life was like in general. I think I was in college and it was my first experience out of the home and I was like, this is great. And then I you know, did whatever I did and then met him in, in February. And I think 
when we met, I was like, this is it. Which is weird, because I, I knew when I met him like that we're, we're going to be together now for the rest of our lives. Like, you're going to be with me. I don't know if he felt the same way when we first got together. <laughs> I was like, no, we're going to be together. But I think just that I was very naive, I think, when we first got together. And I think we went so far from, you know, getting together, getting pregnant so fast and getting married. And then I think we did the years, like 90, I met him in 92, got had a baby in 93, got married in 94, had another baby in 95. So it was just so much that we had. And then in 96, I was like, huh, are we going to stay together? Because we were having some issues, which is which makes sense because mm. we were in our 20s. And of course, then that's the vulnerable age where you're like running around going, are we going to be together? Why are you like this? And, you know, he was doing the same because he's growing too. He's think about an 18 year old man who's got a, a, a bunch of kids and, and this woman that he's not got to take care of. And, you know, we weren't in school. We were going to college. I mean, it was it was a lot. So I think as time's gone on and our kids have gotten older and matured, I think I've become way more confident in who I am as a person. It took a long time. It took a very long time. And it took a lot of, you know, I cried. Like as Ebony said, I cried. I like to cry. So yeah, I would cry. Yes. I would cry all the time. And he would, I mean... And he's not like that. He's very stoic. So he'd look at me, and of course, at, at one point I was like, I didn't understand why he didn't react to my crying. Mm -hmm. And I think now I'm at the point where I just I like to cry, and that's it. If you don't, if you're if you're okay with it, then that's it. You know, I don't need him to react to my emotions the way I did when I was younger. And I think that took a long time because I'm 49 years old now, and so it took a long, long time. And with our kids getting older, as and long maturing, as he's there during the process right as long as he's there and i you know i know he's always there am i needy probably still do i call him a lot yeah but you know what he calls me just as much but it's just you know knowing that he, i i i've never not thought he wasn't going to be there mm -hmm. never so even with everything we've gone through and we've gone through a lot i've never wavered in knowing that he was going to be there at the end of the day and how hard was that pro so you you guys were together for so long you grew with him. Yeah. You didn't have time to grow by yourself. It right. was like you grew with a partner. So you had to yeah. step back and be like, wait a minute here. Like, who yeah. am I? Because yeah. we moved so fast. Like, yeah. And he had to do the same thing. Like, who am I? Yeah. How How is that going to work in our relationship? Yeah. And it, what do we have to do to make it work? Yeah. Because I always say, like, you have to revisit your relationship every year because people change. Yeah. So who I am now might not be who I am next year. So I want to make sure that me and Brittany are on the same page when we go into our relationship. Yeah. Are you still, you still want this? Where are we at? Yeah. Are we moving forward? And I think for us, it's, 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 this is us. We move together. We, we, whatever we do, we do together. So we've grown together, but we've grown and we've just molded. It sounds, you know, it sounds like a, a saying, but we've molded, we are one, we are. Mm. And so the way we move is together. And so we grow together. We do whatever. So, you know, even our maturity, it's it's together. It, it just is. And that's just because that's all we've ever, both of us, that's all we've ever known. Amen. Yeah. So as you navigated through this path while being married, what were some of the challenges you faced mm -hmm. and how did you overcome them? We overcame the challenges of being just young is one. And then, you know, dropping out of college, we put ourselves through both first generation college, put ourselves through college together, raised kids together, you know, got in the workforce together, and then he's in law enforcement. So on top of the fact of being, um, this always makes me, I always get teary about this, but being a mother of, you know, brown children, it, that's, a, that's something in and of itself and add in the layer of now you've got a man who's in law enforcement. So he's got yeah. that dynamic on top of also being a father on top of, you know, the stuff that he's got to go through. And then my job stuff. And it, it, it's, it was, that was one of the hardest things, especially with the kids getting older and worrying about, you know, are they going to be okay? Because then he's got the, of course they're going to be okay. But then you think, well, no, maybe they're not going to be okay because he remembers what it was like before he was in law enforcement. And now we have the, we have the privilege of, of his, of his position, mm. but not everybody has that. And when our kids aren't here, when they're out of, out of this area, they don't have that privilege either. And so I think sometimes they take that for granted as, as well, but that's a hard one to deal with because, you know, 
on top of the level of our marriage, just sitting there thinking, when your kids leave, are they going to be okay? Because I think about that all the time. Every I, parent's fear. Right? It's it's a fear. And, and my son, our youngest, came home. He got pulled over and he was scared to death. And it was just in my heart, like my, my heart just drops. And it's a hard dynamic, I think, for Sam to, to have to deal with, which is, again, something else that he has to deal with on a daily basis. And so, you know, I think. I do want to touch more on that, too. So Sam being a. You can get a little uncomfortable for a second because like, you know, being from a small town, it's it's hard for a black man, right? Yeah. My dad was a black recruiter out here. He was he was a man that was struggling for a long time yeah. just just to be successful and get through. And a lot of black kids don't have their dad out here. Yeah. There's a lot of poverty, a lot of a lot of people struggling. They don't have the father figure in the home, broken homes, women raising kids by themselves. Um, to see a relationship like you and your husband is very powerful to, and young black kids, a young black man looks at you and be like, man, I want, I want a family like that when I get older. You know what I mean? You never know who's watching. And it, it's just very important and it, it's, it, to see the structure. And I don't know if you guys realize how many people you might be inspiring, but it's, it's a lot. <laughs> Cause even me, you know, I look at your relationship and I'm like, wow, that's, truly inspiring and then I, I just first of all I commend you and I respect what you guys are doing and, and, and I love what you guys are you. Shed, that you guys are shedding light on these topics in yeah. the community um, I think it's awesome and I just think it's very important that we need to see more black men in the household taking care and handling their business and yeah. being held accountable yeah. so that we can have more strong families and Go, speaking Amen on that to topic, that, man. Amen to that. That's, that's all I gotta say right now. Yeah. Well, let's, but Johans, I know you're yeah. passionate about that topic. Yes, I know that's something you really like to. <clears throat> no, yeah. Hardcore. I mean, you know, my my real opinion is this. You know, I, I look at black men in society, um, out there in entertainment and all of it, and they become successful, and you know, sometimes they choose to be with the wonderful people. Um, I'd like to see, I'd like to see some of us, you know. Let's consider black women. Black women are beautiful too. And they're super intelligent. And they will encourage you to be the best version of, of yourself that you can be. And I, I just gotta keep it real. Um, that's how I feel about it. I feel like we need to consider that as an option when you are a successful black man who's trying to do something with yourself. I understand that sometimes we're surrounded by a different crowd. Um, but, and you know, you can't really choose who you fall in love with. But I kind of feel like some of us make a choice to not be with a black woman. Why not? Why not be able be with a black woman? Um, you know, does that make me any type of racist or anything like that? I love all people. You know, I love I love people. I, I love humans. Um, but I love black women. Mm. Amen. Amen. All right, that's what I got for you, Amir. You're at the hot seat. You're at the hot seat now. That's uh -oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so since Johan, you just finished up, we'll, we'll actually start back up with you with some questions. Um, what were some of the biggest difficulties you faced during marriage, and how did you and your partner handle them together? Um, going into my marriage, I had a whole bunch of hubris. You know, I thought I had relationships figured out after being, you know, being divorced and sort of dating and, and playing the field and so on. I thought I had a few things figured out. Um, between the psychology test I mentioned earlier and um, just some of the things I've studied about myself. I just had a whole bunch of hubris. I was like, my wife's over there laughing. Um, so, you know, I just had a whole bunch of hubris thinking that I had it all figured out, but I got smacked in the face. Um, this entre <laughs> entrepreneurial life and working, you know, building Black Fur Media, um, building, you know, Johans Billy Photography before that, building the wedding business, Black Tie Brothers. Um, I got hit in the mouth with, simply being extremely busy and forgetting that I had a woman at home that needed my attention as well. And um, there was an old school song back in the day, um, when a woman's fed up, you know what I'm saying? And nothing you can do about it. R. Kelly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, I know that was R. Kelly, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we can scratch that out, take that out of the video. No, no, no. no. Leave, leave that will get me that's him that's himself That's a sample. <laughs> that, 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 R. Kelly sample. That's the good stuff, we need that. Don't, don't get me hemmed up. 
Okay. <laughs> um, I do not condone, uh, you know. But anyway. Uh, but no. But it's a good song. Though. But it is a good song. <laughs> yeah. It's the art by itself. Let's just take the art right by itself. But um, essentially, you know, forgetting that she needed my attention as well. Um, I would come home and immediately hop on the computer and just start editing pictures. I just took a photo shoot. Blah, blah, blah. Ba- I expected her to be there for me, but I wasn't there for her. Yeah. And one day she said to me, um, you know, you have a partner, but I don't. And that's, that smacked me in the face because I was like, we had such a long honeymoon phase. And I'm going to get emotional, but we had such a long honeymoon phase, longest honeymoon phase I've ever had in my life, any relationship. We were just obsessed with each other for a year, couldn't be apart from each other. Um, for any second <laughs> before we started getting anxiety. Um, and coming out of that, this business separated us, like pulled us apart um, in the honeymoon phase. And we were about to go on vacation to Mexico. And she said to me, uh, we're not going to go. I go, why not? She goes, because essentially I don't really like you right now. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. if I want to spend time with you um, because you don't pay attention to me. And it's all about your camera and your business and all that kind of stuff. So I had to take a step back and, and understand the, the balance of things. <clears throat> so we started making a rule where I come home from work because um, I was still working as a nurse as well. OK, so I mean, for us, men, we talk about hard work and hustle, but it's still balance, right? Like, yes, a woman likes a man who works hard and does his thing, but you still got to pay attention to her and give her that love and attention she needs. Yeah. Um, and so I had to learn how, where her balance was at, what she needed from me and what her love language was. And for her, her love language was deeds, okay? So she needed, if she asked me to do something, I would dismiss it and be like, I'm gonna get to it when I get to it. You can't do that. Um, so I, I developed a culture where I was like, if she asked me to do something, I do it right away so I don't forget. Um, you know, immediate action. Right? And if I can't do it myself, I'll pay somebody to do it. But at least it's getting done. Um, I don't, so I don't dismiss her needs at all. I, I, and she could speak to it too. I asked her, I said, if I'm coming home from work, I go, babe, I'm on my way home. What do you need? Am I lying? So I, I always call her and so a good relationship is work. We talked about it being choice is also work and finding out where your partner's point is and where they need. Because she can't just be there just for me to do the laundry, make sure I take my blood pressure pills or whatever it is like she does. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got to make sure she got what she need too. So um, her happiness is important to me. It's not just about my happiness. So. Uh, for us dudes out there and so on, it's just, you know, we, I got smacked in the mouth with that, finding where the middle ground was at, and the way we overcome it is through conversation and honesty. The foundation of our relationship, and in my life in general, is keeping it real and keeping it honest all the time, hmm. without exception. Because I say, hey, look, if you're honest with me, we can get past almost anything. I just need that honesty from you. And it, it's up to me if I want to accept it or not. And if I consider your happiness to be a part of the equation, um, and it is. For me, it is. And that's how we got past it. We were honest with each other. We compromised. We made sure that we treat each other the way we want to be treated. I know people try to popularize the platinum rule. If I don't know you, I don't know how to treat you. But I know what I like, and I like nice things. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to treat you real nice. You literally just answered every question that I had in the order. <laughs> so good job. <laughs> but no, that's that's very great insight. And going back to love languages, that's very important too. And actually, Brittany was talking to me about that because I wasn't huge on love languages until I really understood how important it was to my partner. You know, Brittany's love language is physical touch. You know, just because I think she's going to like it doesn't mean she's going to like it. Just because it's my love language doesn't mean it's her love language. So it's very important to know what your partner's love language is. Because if you don't know their love language and you aren't giving them what they need, then they're always going to feel like something's missing and they always aren't going to feel loved. You know what I mean? So, Ebony. You ready? I mean, I say it like I say it like it's a game show or something. <laughs> Newlywed game. Ebony, um, could you share how being in toxic relationships from your past affected your self-esteem and overall well-being? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I spent actually twenty uh, sixteen years in a toxic marriage, like very toxic. Um, not only was it 
verbally abusive. It was physically abusive. Um, we both went back and forth to jail <clears throat> for beating each other up, like all different kinds of things. So, um, you know, it really just, it almost stripped me of who I thought I was. You know what I mean? Like I became this other person who was obsessed with almost getting back or hurting the other person, right? Because they had hurt me or, you know, we were going through a season or a phase or whatever it may be. And so I just kind of lost myself. I'm really outgoing, jovial, um, you know, and I, I just kind of just was not that for a lot of years. And it took me a long time um, I had to do a lot of inner work, you know what I mean? Just uh, therapy and talking to someone, talking about all the trauma I experienced, right? Because I was still holding all of that in as well, you know what I mean? And um, just getting all of that out helped me to decide to be a better person. And then I had a I had a mentor, um, Larry Parham. He recently passed away, but um, you know I had went through something really terrible, and I called him. He was almost like a second father, and I called him like you know. I, effed up this time I really and he just was like in three words you know flip the switch for me he's like Ebony you really have to decide the type of person you want to be and just hearing that from him was almost like stunning you know what I mean like wow this person who I thought <laughs> you know held me up on this pedestal and loved me so much was like nah you're actually crappy and you're messing up and you need to flip it around right but he said it in such a loving way you know <laughs> And so um, I thought, you know, I thought on that for a long time. I kind of changed people, places and things, changed my surroundings, people I was around and, um, you know, just kind of kept using that to move for forward and propel myself forward. I love that. Do you think that's important, too? That's just we talk about this all the time, who you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I think in a marriage, you know, if you surround yourself with people that aren't good for your marriage, it's not good for life and not just, you know, you know, it could be anybody. I mean, the two of us have both removed people from our lives that just weren't good for our family. Mm -hmm. And it's been both of us that have done it. It's not just one of us that have done it, but I think that affects the way you react, you know, definitely got yeah. people around you. And, you know, I was young too. I got married really young yeah. at, at 18, 19, um, had my first kid by 20. So we have that in common. And my one flaw was that I was always running back to my mama, always running back to my mom. Mom, he did this. He did that. He did this. And then expecting her to like smile in his face at Thanksgiving. You know what I mean? Like just little immature mistakes that you make that you think that you're, you're not even thinking, right? You're literally thinking about yourself and not thinking about the situation. So just those kind of things I learned over the years too, like just be mature. I did that one time. Yeah. I did that one time <laughs> and we were, it was right before we got married and I called my dad. We got into a huge fight and I called my dad. My dad came over and my mom called me and she said, if you want us to love him, mm -hmm. you can't do that again. Mm -hmm. She said, you can't do that again. She said, unless it's something where you're in danger, she said, if you want us to love him, you cannot do that again. I'm right. glad you said that. Yeah. That, that's, that's amazing. Your mom's a smart person. Yeah. And she was and she was right. Mm -hmm. And it it was because it wasn't anything at the time. Of, of course, to me as a 19 year old, it was like, you know, we got into this huge fight. Right. And mm -hmm. he, I think I said he hurt my feel. I think he, I might have said he hurt me <laughs> when I meant he hurt my feelings. So my dad, the first he got in the truck and he came right over and he was right. there and he must have gone home to my mom and been like, right. this crazy. Right. Girl, you know, and, you know, like, dad, like, all, all he said he was, was no. And she just. <laughs> and, that was, and, that, and that was it. And she called. And she said, "If you want us to love him, and they and they love him. I mean, he's. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they love him more than me half the time. But you, yeah, you will forgive him, but your parents won't. Right? right. Yep. Yep. So I learned true. that the hard way too, because I, I, you know, my mom. I always confided in her. She was she was my emotional support. And my mom is a worry worries a lot. So mm. you know, I can't tell her certain things about my relationship because she worries a little too much, and she tries to fix things that she mm. can't fix. Only I can fix in my relationship. So that's a very valid point. And um, Ebony, I got one more question for you. Sure. All right, so reflecting on your journey, how have those experiences shaped you into the better woman you are today? And what positive changes do you feel you've undergone as a result? I think I'm way more reflective now. Um, I used to be so reactive. Um, I guess I would consider myself an outgoing person, right? And so it was just like whatever 
I thought in that instant, impulsive, like that's what I did. You know, did I want to punch you? Then that's what I do. Do I want to bust the windows out your car? Well, that's what I do. Quickly. You know? <laughs> and then, you know, it all comes back to maturity for me. I think a lot of people say that men, you know, mature slower than women. And I think we have some women who mature pretty slowly as well. I think I was one of them. <laughs> You know, and so now I'm 42. I just turned 42 and I can think more clearly now. You know, I can sit back and, re and, and reflect on all of the options. Right. And not choose the most impulsive option. And, um, you know, that has gotten me very far. It's been successful trial and error. It's been successful. So I think I'll keep doing that. That's powerful. I just want to say, Ebony, like I kind of fell in love with your story over time because you had like when I first met you. And we sat down and we talked. You just kept it real. You're like, listen, I've been in jail. I did this and that. I was like, you were very honest, kept the straight face. And yep. you you held, like you were honest to who you were and what you've been through. And you didn't try to hide it. And you admitted your flaws and how you got to where you are now. That's, that is like, I don't see how anybody can't fall in love with your story. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm glad we were able to talk the about it a little bit today. Ebony's a hero. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> very much so a lot of life left to live oh yeah definitely i mean i have so many plans and i mean now that we're hooked up you know i, I can't think of um any place else that i would rather be than with y'all and helping y'all with y'all plans and just you know making sure everybody's great amen hey i got a question for you you put me on the spot i actually had, I know, I had right? questions here. i was gonna cut the camera like cut the yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a question for in. you. So my question is right there. I got a question for you. But you can ask me whatever. All right, so let's go. What, what are some of the struggles that you you went through? I mean, that you've seen that your parents that was on, that was on the list too. And yeah. how you how you? I got you. Okay. Yeah. How how'd you? Uh, some of the struggles that you've seen with your parents and how they got over it, and what did you learn from that? Um. My mom and my dad had struggles growing up where they felt like they wanted to give up on the relationship. And they didn't want to continue. And I think that that's the point in a relationship. Everybody's going to go through that point in every relationship where they're like, do I want to continue? Especially after 5, 10, 15 years. They didn't give up on us. They, they stuck together while me and my sister were growing up. And it wasn't always easy. There were arguments. There were fights. But they worked through it. And I think that that's the most, that's the biggest key in that whole relationship. And what I saw was my dad never gave up on my mom and my mom never gave up on my dad. My dad still provided. He wasn't like, you know, I'm done. You know what I mean? You take care of it. You handle it yourself. No, my dad made sure we were well taken care of. My mother was there as my support system, even though she was going through what she was going through. And I think that that's important. And it takes a village to raise kids, right? Like, it's not just the mom and the dad. It's the aunts, the uncles, the the brothers the sisters like it's so important to just have that family dynamic and there's so much child trauma that occurs when you don't have a parent and these children are growing up and they don't have that support system and they're missing something and they they grow up and they're already set up for failure the level of it's like you have to work through these you already have to work through enough when you have both your parents so now when you have one parent and you're going through child trauma it's just so hard to get through and get by Cause you're already set up for failure. And it's like the whole point of this and what we're doing here and talking about masculine and feminine and the roles and relationships and why it's important to have a man and a woman in the house is to support the idea of having the male, the mom and the dad. They might not be together, which is fine, but understanding their role in a relationship and not leaving their kids to do it on their own, building that support system and understand that the men have to be held accountable Women have to be held accountable too. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's the message I really just want to deliver. It's healthy masculinity and femininity and the importance of it in relationships. And that's just my my views and on this whole yep. discussion, you know? Appreciate it. And um I was gonna have you ask me some questions, but I feel like we 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 touched enough on on the general topics. I got a question for you, though. I got. But if you got one. questions, okay, let's yeah, go. Oh, I, I see you got a list right yep. there. Yeah, this is a two-part right. <laughs> two question. What are some of the struggles you saw your parents go through? And part two, how did it affect your view on relationships? Ooh, that's some good <laughs> questions. 
Um, some of the struggles I saw my mom and my dad go through was my dad was in the military. He was active duty for a while, so he was traveling a lot. And my mom was taking care of us by herself mm. a lot. And that was really hard on her because my dad wasn't around. He was working. He was trying to provide for the family. So um, that led to like a separation at one point in the relationship. And it was hard for them to be emotionally connected. And I'm sure it created doubts within the, within the relationship. My dad deciding if he wanted to be with my mom and my mom deciding if she wanted to keep dealing with that. You know, so that that was a very tough um, period of time that they they work through, but it it wasn't easy. It's uh, relationships have ugly moments like that, you know. And what was your second question? How did it affect your view on relationships? Um, and I'm just gonna go back to what I said: is it made me realize that relationships aren't perfect, and you go through things, but you get through them, and you do what's and you do what's best. And it, it, I do say that to say this too. If you're in an abusive, toxic relationship where you guys are beating each other up and fighting, it's much more healthy to be apart than to be together. Mm -hmm. But if you can work through it and you can make it work and you guys are both committed to making it work and you have kids involved, then it's, I would 100% say go back up to bat and try again. And I say, you know, when I talk about Sam and I, I said, you know, we're not perfect. I mean, how many times did we say we were going to separate? Every, I mean, when we first got together, we were all like, we're separated. That's it. We're yes, separated. Sam, tell us. We, I mean, we were always saying we were separated. But then as as time went on, you know, we're not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you know, the immaturity of being, you know, teenagers and then late 20s and then whatever. We're not together anymore. We're not, Well, we're still together. Right. It's just, you know, and then you cry and then you lose 10 pounds. And I wish I could lose 10 pounds like I could then where you wouldn't eat and you wouldn't. When I'm like, now I'm like, I'm not going to not eat because we're fighting. Right. You know, I'm not right. going to not. We'll be good in a week. We're good. We'll be good in a week. Or like, the, you know, the no, bed. Seriously. Like, I like my bed. I'm not not sleeping in my bed. So we're going to sleep in the bed together. Yes. And <laughs> right. we're, we're going to be. Just back to back, right? Back to back. And that's going to be the way it is. But, you know, it's not easy. And I don't ever want anybody to think, you know, for us, it's not. It wasn't. It wasn't easy. And our kids, one of the, especially my youngest, will say, because he's much more vocal, he'll say, I remember you and dad fighting. And, you know, everybody's view, every child, don't you think, every child's view of a relationship is different? Because mm -hmm. my three kids will all say three different things about a relationship. When they were all doing the same thing, I was like, that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just by the way they grew up. You know, my younger one's like, you know, I remember you guys yelling at each other. And then the middle one was like, I would I would be there when you guys were yelling at each other and I would take care of the younger one. I was like, no, you didn't. But he's that's how he saw it. So maybe he did. And we just didn't see that. And then the older one, she's so much older. There's she's you know, there's a 10 year difference between the oldest mm -hmm. and youngest. So she got, you know, unfortunately, she got the worst probably of us because we were so young when we had her. And, you know, that makes me teary. I feel bad about that. But it's hard. Perspective, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Um, as far as us in the panel, I feel like you know. We do you guys have any more questions or anything you guys would like to add to the conversation? No. I will say this. Um, this is not a solution. This is not something that we're coming to a solution with. This is just something that we're opening up and talking about important topics, and people are gonna take what they want from it, depending on their perspective yeah. of the conversation, right? So I'm just glad that we were able to have healthy conversation and talk about uncomfortable topics and be very personal. So I do appreciate you guys for um, doing this with me. Do we want to do a couple of questions from uh, yeah. the audience? I was thinking we would jump into a Q&A after this if anybody had questions and wanted to be on camera. So uh, does anybody have any, any questions in regards to what we've been talking about or adding to the conversation of what you guys feel is important to have a healthy relationship. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody has something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I, obviously, uh, Amira is my wife, and I, I love her dearly. So I guess I'll ask uh, the, the question now, and, and I'm hoping you're, you're completely honest with me. Um, do you feel, after everything that we've gone through, where we are right now 
in the midst of our relationship, our life, and, and what we're trying to do as parents. Are you happy with where you are right now? You put me on the spot. Ab- absolutely. <laughs> Ab- absolutely. And, and if not, what, what can I do to make things better for you? Right? <laughs> I appreciate that you asked me that. I think it, it probably made you think a little bit too. And I, uh, you know, yeah. I am happy. And I said this a, a few days ago, you know, I think we're in the best place that we've ever been. I think there's still outside things that, that will affect us, but I think we, I always say, we do it together. So, you know, I get teary when we talk about it, mm-hmm. but I am, I'm, I'm, I'm the happiest we've ever been. And I think, you know, just, we communicate. Mm-hmm. One of the things I think we do is, you know, when we talked about communicating with each other, you were talking about the psychology tests and stuff. We'll say to each other, how'd you take what I just said? Because sometimes our views of things are so different. Like Mm -hmm. I'll say something to him and he's like, that's not at all what I meant. And I was like, well, that's what I, that's what I heard you said. He's like, you're insane. And that's not what at all what I was thinking. So it's just interesting. I think us just talking and communicating and, and knowing that you love me enough to ask that question. You know what I mean? That's, that's the important thing. He had you, they had you thinking today, right? Going, (laughs) are you happy? (laughs) <laughs> All right, cool. Um, honey, is there anything you would like to add to what you feel is important to have a healthy relationship? Sure. <laughs> um, I guess I'm going to touch on what Ebony said because the entire time you're talking, all I heard was you holding yourself accountable, right? And I think accountability is a huge part for any relationship to work mm-hmm. because. Um, there are going to be times where you're going to hurt your partner's feelings and that might not be your intentions, but if you love them, you need to take accountability to how you did hurt them. And I guess for Ebony, for you, what do you think was like the first step for you to take accountability, like with yourself to try to, you know, be that better version of yourself to keep evolving? Okay. So, um, I actually have not told this story to many people. I told these people have heard it. So um, I used to sell drugs, weed, a lot of weed. And I had this ottoman just like this. And it it had a zipper on the bottom. And I had a tin in there where I would keep all my weed. My money was my stash and I would stuff it under there. So my sister came to take my three-year-old to the fair. And he walked right over to the stash and was like, mommy, I need money, I need money. Yeah, oh shit. I was like, wow, you are not doing this right. You're like moving backwards. (laughs) And um, that was the day I just decided, you know, enough is enough. You got to change your life around. Like (laughs) I went the total, I jumped all the way out the window and signed up for Bible school. So I have my, (laughs) I have a bachelor's in Bible (laughs) because I was like, listen, you got to go to college. You got to just flip everything around because you cannot let your kids grow up thinking that this shit is normal. Powerful. Yeah. Kids will do it to you. Uh-huh. Let's see one more question. Anybody else? You guys good? All right, cool. All right. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you guys for joining and being a part of this. I just think this was a really awesome experience. experience and it's opening up the door to so much more in the future. So, this is just a small piece to, to the bigger puzzle as we go forward, guys. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs>